Hello and welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. On today's program, we get down in the dirt with Jim and Merlene Stiles as we discuss plants and the projects they have been a part of around Austin. We talked to Courtney Duncanson of Compere Financial about financial risk management in agriculture. And the University of Minnesota Extension brings us a new best practices segment, all today on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections made possible in part by Minnesota Corn Growers Association, working to identify and promote opportunities for corn growers, enhance quality of life, and help others understand the value and importance of corn production to America's economy. EDP Renewables North America, owner-operator of Prairie Star and Pioneer Prairie Wind Farms, Minnesota and Iowa. EDPR Wind Farms and Solar Parks provide income to farmers and help power rural economies across the continent. Northern Country Co-op, a full-service cooperative in grain, agronomy, feed, and lumber. For the latest news, job openings, and podcasts, you can go to their website, ncountrycoop.com. RNS Grain Systems, a family-owned business serving its customers for 50 years with leading designs in the manufacturing of grain handling equipment and grain storage systems. You can call them for a quote today. Welcome to Farm Connections. I'm with Jim Stiles from Superfresh in Austin, Minnesota. Welcome to Farm Connections, Jim. Thank you, Dan. You have a beautiful place, and we really like the things that are going on here. Tell us about your business. Oh, goodness. Oh, my. Yes, it's, uh, it's quite a business. Yeah, the Garden Center is in full swing now, and uh, we keep that going all through the spring and summer and into the fall. And all year we have the bakery going where we have donuts and breads and cookies. And, and then, too, we also have a lot of local foods here, too, that we really enjoy we're foodies, my wife and I, we enjoy trying different foods and restaurants and, and local items like that. So that's always a part of our passion too. Jim, how long have you been doing this business? Yeah. So I moved up here in 1980. From? Uh, from, uh, yeah, from Iowa. I grew up in Owine, Iowa and uh, came up here and, and my dad was here from 70 to 80. And uh, then he moved down to Arkansas, but before that, We've always been in the produce business, uh, going around the country, getting fruits and vegetables and, and bringing them here. It used to be just a produce market here. And over the years, we've, we've changed and evolved. Well, Jim, you moved from Owine, Iowa to Austin, Minnesota. Uh, you you uh, worked in the family business or did you buy it right away? Yeah, right away. I, I worked in it for 20 years before, you know, we're familiar with it, the produce business. But uh, my dad, he, he left then and moved to Arkansas and, and we communicated closely and he helped a great deal too with, with uh, phone calls and coming up and helping out. And, and, uh, but, but yeah, we've made mistakes, made a lot of mistakes, but y you know, you hopefully learn from them and hopefully they're not too devastating of mistakes and you can learn and, and go, go to the next challenge you have. You're still here, you're still serving the community, so obviously you had at least one more good decision than bad. Yes, yes, I know, yeah, yeah. Speaking of family, so yeah. when did Marlene come into the scene and how did you meet her? I know, yeah, so in, in 84, I was here for four years and, you know, being a single single guy, you don't always know where to go and, and you know, YMCA, you know, and, and I didn't go there to meet you know, her or anything like that, just to get in shape. But once you walk through the doors, it was like, hallelujah, you know, a lot of, a lot of great young people around there and, and friends that we made and, and as a benefit in one of the classes, there she was. So go to the YMCA, right? Go to the YMCA, do good things and yeah. yeah. Aerobics, class, yeah. meeting people, yeah. conversation, and then a spouse. Then a spouse, yes. Wow, that's quite a deal for a membership fee. 
<laughs> yes, uh, yeah, priceless, right? Yeah. I would say. Yeah. So it's a pretty challenging business because you've got the seasons, but how do you kind of master the weather in your environment? Well, thank goodness we have greenhouses, right, that we can heat. Um, and in order to prepare for each season, we have to start in February. Uh, with, we get the plants in February, so we have to start before that actually. Um, so it's, it becomes almost a year-round business in that regard, even though we only have the plants in the spring, because you also have to order everything in way ahead of time, a year ahead of time. And so you have to predict what you will need to order, do your ordering, uh, prepare the greenhouses, and change the plastic once in a while and uh, keep everything going, the heaters that are needed, as we know in Minnesota. And we need those heaters in the evening in February for the plants uh, and into May sometimes. So, <laughs> so it's a challenge to keep everything um, in shape. And then of course the watering. The watering is a big operation as well to keep everything watered and to keep the water flowing. You have a background in biology. Tell us about that. Right, I have a master's in biology um, from St. Cloud State and I've always fortunately been able to work in biology in some uh, capacity. I was the Cicada Lake State Park naturalist one summer and uh, I've been in working for the city of Austin in the lab at the wastewater treatment plant. I've also done research at the Hormel Institute. Um, I've also worked at the University of Minnesota. So really a wonderful experience in my career. And then where my real, I think, contribution was to Superfresh was developing the prairie plants and getting the prairie plants going here. And then Jim and I planted our first prairie in 2004 in our front yard. And we didn't really know what we were doing. And uh, so we planted six foot high grasses instead of three foot high grasses. But our neighbors are very tolerant and uh, <laughs> we're very fortunate in that regard. Uh, and uh, so over the years we've discovered that, oh, a lot of things get shaded out if you plant a lot of tall prairie grasses as well. So we've just learned a lot along the way. And Jim now especially has learned how to propagate the prairie plants, not just to buy them in four inch pots. Um, and so that's been a real learning curve for us as well. Well, that is pretty neat. You've done the experimenting so you can tell the customers and other landowners how to do it. Right, we, and we do that too. We do tell them how they can collect their own seeds and then uh, either have them outside in the winter or have them in a refrigerator in a moist um, bed of paper towels or something because they do have to be in our winter in order to sprout in the spring. They have to experience our winter. So it's kind of interesting how prairie plants work. Your biology major came in very handy. It did. You did some work with the J. Hormel uh, Nature Center as well, didn't you? Right. I, um, I was an intern there for a year and learned a lot of the curriculum, was able to uh, volunteer after that uh, with a lot of school children that came out there. And then when I uh, worked for um, Austin Public Schools at the high school, I taught environmental studies and we went out there for 10 field trips a year um, doing different activities. So. It, it, the Nature Center has been an integral part of my work and my volunteer work as well. Bernine, you, you certainly contribute to the community, the surrounding community, with beautifying and also providing a product that people need and want. But what other things have you done to integrate into the community? Well, we generally donate to a lot of fundraisers um, and where, where we can, we help out. Um, the different organizations that we're involved in, especially Austin Audubon, Isaac Walton League, friends of the J.C. Hormel Nature Center. And then, so, so we're kind of privy to what they're doing. So we're like, oh, you need this, you need something. So we supply it. Or sometimes there's a, a group will come out and just say, can you, can you give us some door prizes? So we'll give them some hanging baskets or something. Well, you're so embedded in 
really involved in the community, and that's perhaps different than some large corporations. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. We enjoy it. Well, she claims that she's been a good partner and part of the business. What do you claim? Oh, yeah, she's, you know, she's wonderful. She's not here all the time, which is good, because I can, I can throw things at her and, and get her ideas. And, and, her, and her knowledge of science, you know, is just wonderful. She has her master's in, in aquatic biology, and she, she just understands science and food, too, things that we share, and, and yeah, the plants, and, and helping us out in the store, too, to, to just have a, a safe environment for our customers, and, and a fun environment that, that helps, too, with other passions of ours, local passions of groups that we belong to, and, and being able to help them. Well, it's so important to have the passion because there's a lot yeah. of hours and there's some yeah. days you don't yeah. always get paid for your hours, yeah. but you have a business to run, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's busy this time of year. It's it's a lot of hours. It's seven days a week, 12, 14 hour days, but it doesn't last too long. It lasts uh, maybe six, eight weeks or so. And and then uh, then we can relax a little bit. But too, we have great help here. At, at Super Fresh, and, and I'm always thankful for that. Uh, or, yeah. That's huge. It is, it is, and people, you know, a lot of our employees enjoy the flowers, they enjoy the local food, and, uh, and too, we, we just have the best customers, too. They're, they're, they just love to come out and shop and look, and lots of times they'll bring family out or friends that are visiting, and, and uh, you know, when you can work around plants and flowers and and good donuts all year and good coffee, local coffee and things like that. It's, it brings a smile to people's faces. Jim, many times people working with plants or a yard want a little advice on what to do for pollinators and how to make their environment better. Any advice? Yeah, well, people come in and they say, gee, Jim, my garden isn't doing very good this year. You know, a lot of my vegetables, they aren't really setting fruits and uh, certainly for that reason pollinators are very very necessary but pollinators too they it's that whole food chain where pollinators provide food for for birds and it just goes up the scale from there so it's and they recognize native plants pollinators do birds do turkeys deer squirrels i mean they they recognize native plants and for that reason they're very important if a customer comes to super fresh do you have any resources you can share with them booklets pamphlets or anything like that yeah we sure do uh, yeah we have this book right here it's from saint paul audubon and dan i'm going to ask you a question how many larval insects does a chickadee family feed their young in one clutch. So if they have three or four chicks, how many larval insects? Many. I'm not sure. It's like six to eight thousand larval insects. Wow. I know. And where do they get those from? Well, oak trees are a huge source. Oak trees supply over 500 species of larval insects, over 500 varieties of larval insects. And it's, and it's, good with oaks, it's good with native shrubs, it's good with native prairie plants. So in that respect, that's, that's why we can't, we need, we need a balance. And to have that balance of native trees or shrubs, maybe a little patch of prairie in your yard that helps those larval insects, that is wonderful. If you like to look at chickadees and cardinals and, and all those birds, like we all do, we, we need those things in our yard. The cycle of life. It is, it is. And, and that's above the ground. You start going below the ground with native plants and the average root system on native plants, anywhere from five foot into the ground to 20 foot down into the ground. And just imagine what kind of insects live in that soil. And there too, diversity is key to healthy soil. Jim, I'm thinking, I've got a visual of that 
root system, and I'm thinking yeah. it's probably going to help protect our soils from moving around either by wind or, or water. Any thoughts? Oh, wonderful there, Dan. You know, in, in our front yard, we have a native prairie in our front yard, and our sump pump goes out to our native prairie, and it doesn't go out of that native prairie. But, but exactly, you know, you do a small patch of prairie, maybe five foot by five foot, Native prairie can absorb eight inches of water in like six hours. And, uh, and it can do that again and again and again. So it, it, those roots go down, the water will go down too. And that's why buffers are so important along our waterways. If people check out Mill Pond, and a lot of them do, we planted thousands of native plants around Mill Pond not only to help with water quality, but to help with insects and frogs and turtles and birds, and, and of course the flowers, and then you get the, the pollinators too. Awesome advice. Thank you so much, yeah, Jim. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Dan. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. Farm Connections, best practices brought to you by Hello, I'm Bruce Potter, Integrated Pest Management Specialist with the University of Minnesota Extension. And today on best practices, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about a relatively new insect pest to Minnesota soybeans. Not that we didn't have uh, enough pests before, but we picked up a new one. We confirmed it in Minnesota in 2018, although uh, one of the growers had mentioned that he'd seen the, seen the problem for several years, years uh, previous. Uh, in 2015 and through 2017, uh, the insect was observed in eastern South Dakota, eastern Nebraska, western Iowa, but it was assumed to uh, just be a secondary invader to plants, soybean plants that were damaged by hail or disease. In 2018, this thing blew up in the spring and uh, we realized that this insect was capable of uh, causing uh, plant damage and death to soybeans all on its own. The adult larvae overwinter and pupate in the spring and, and the adults emerge in mid-June. Uh, they lay eggs at the base of the soybean plant. If you're looking at the soybean field, uh, a lot of times you'll see the damage worse on the edge of the, in fact, almost always you'll see damage worse on the edge of soybeans adjacent to the previous year's soybean crops as that's where the adults move out of. To distinguish this from a disease, uh, look at that lower stem, you'll see a dark discoloration. A lot of times there's kind of a black border between the green healthy tissue above and the damaged tissue below. But if you peel back that outer layer of the stem, the bark if you will, uh, you'll start to see some white to orange larvae in the stems. There's three larval instars and uh, they start out white. That last instar turns orange and is pretty distinctive. We've got a similar insect that uh, feeds on white mold fungus. Uh, but this insect is not associated with fun, uh, white mold. It'll be uh, on plants that are, are relatively disease-free. There's uh, three flights of adults, the overwintering flight, one in July and another one in August. Uh, when the plant uh, larvae are mature, they drop to the ground and pupate. And that last generation in August, the larvae are what overwinters. You'll start to see plants wilting in July. And again, damage is use, usually worse on the edge of the field. And as the season progresses, that damage affects more plants and moves further into the field. So if you see uh, damage like that on your soybeans uh, adjacent to last year's crop, pay some attention, take a look at uh, what's underneath a few of the uh, surface of some of those stems. We also have a scouting video available and there's a soybeangallmidge.org website that has quite a bit of information on this insect, fact sheets, webinars, uh, when we're monitoring adult flights. So when those adults are out, will be posted on that as well. So thank you for listening. This has been Best Practices and I'm Bruce Potter, the University of Minnesota Extension. Welcome to Farm Connections. I'm with Courtney Duncanson from Compeer. Welcome to Farm Connections. Thank you, thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. You do an awful lot with risk management and finance. Can you tell us what that is and what it means? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really about understanding the risks of your operation and what things can you do to protect your operation to be viable long term. Um, but 
really honestly, before you can just jump right to the risk management, you got to understand your financials and your base numbers because it's really hard to have an effective risk management plan without understanding where you start and where your goals are of where you want to be in the future. Well, Compere does lots of things, including financing farm operations, correct? Correct, yeah. We strive to be a trusted financial services partner um, in agriculture and rural America. So we do provide loans, leases, uh, do uh, different types of risk management. So we have crop insurance, life insurance, um, as well as some other additional services. We have a dairy consulting team um, and a tax and accounting team as well that will help clients on farm. Why is risk management that essential? Why does it need to be provided? Well, uh, just think about volatility. Uh, you know, look at today, I haven't looked at market prices lately, but this morning corn was over $7 and soybeans $17 and what it was four or five years ago, we were sub $3. So it's, it's that volatility. You never know uh, where that roller coaster is gonna be. Um, look at land values, what they've done the last year. Um, so it can be, that volatility can really be that positive where we're in the markets today. Um, but can also have those downturns. Um, think about the supply demand and, or the supply right now for chemicals and the price increases we've seen uh, with Roundup and, and other um, chemicals as well. The volatility is there. So understanding that um, where your numbers are at and what things you can do to manage and mitigate that, that risk uh, with those volatilities are important. So is it safe to say that you help producers protect their margin? Yes. It, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's producers, they make all the decisions on their operation. We can provide guidance and expertise of what we see their financial numbers telling us. Uh, we do some benchmarking as well, so you have that peer-to-peer -peer analysis part of it. Really, um, you know, where, where are their competitive advantage is, where they can really um, stick out, and also where are their areas of focus that they can maybe tone in on to really um, try and improve upon. But at the end of the day, with that, we can only do our job of really helping with the financial counseling aspect um, as long as clients can provide us the financial information to help tell their story. Can you think of one particular success story in your business that really makes you uh, proud? Yeah, so, you know, I come from the underwriting, the credit department, so really that analyzing, looking at numbers. Um, but I would say we've really strived uh, with that too is we call it a team relationship model. And so leveraging all of the expertise we have at Compere. And so that, yes, you have your relationship manager, that main salesperson that works with the client, but we have a team of experts and let's leverage everyone when we can. So for example, it's bringing underwriting on farm to help maybe share those benchmarking reports and what we're seeing um, in that peer-to-peer -peer analysis. So I think the success story around that is you know, meeting with clients, maybe in times when things are really tough and it's helping them through, okay, what are your options? And what is your plan B, plan C, when plan A doesn't work? Um, and how, do you, how can you manage those margins and get back to a profitable level? And um, being willing to really think about all of the options. You know, it's, and having, there might be times when you have to have those tough conversations and challenge yourself to what makes most sense. And that can tie back to that risk management of how you understand your numbers, where can you protect yourself, whether that's through a marketing plan, whether that's through crop insurance, whether that's through a transition plan. We often talk about the four Ds, death, disease, disability, and divorce. And everyone thinks and always wants to say, that'll never happen to me. I'm protected, that, that'll never happen. Um, but they do happen. So what plans do you have in place that you can protect and have your operation be viable in the future if one of those big Ds occur? And how can you weather that situation? What's at stake if risk management is not in place or it's subpar? Well, you really got to ride that volatility roller coaster. And um, 
you know, understand how, how do you get from point A to point B then? You're a, a price taker, you're, um, you pay for inputs, whatever the inputs are that day. It's really hard to truly maybe plan ahead and manage your margins at the end of the day. Um, another piece we talk about a lot is liquidity you know, working capital, your current assets minus your current liabilities. What can be turned into cash in 12 months is another way to look at it. And the more of that you have, the better positioned you are for, for two things, to withstand adversity, as well as to be positioned to be able to take op advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. You buy that combine you win wanting to buy. Buy that neighbor's 80 acres when it comes up for sale expand from you know, 100 cows, 200 cows, whatever that may look like. And so without some risk management, you may be jeopardizing where that working capital position can be and how you can take advantage of either of those two, whether the storm or take advantage of opportunities. Great advice, Courtney. Thanks for helping our farm families. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. You're welcome. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. It all comes down to planning. When we take the time to set a plan, we set ourselves up for future success. Whether that is in crops or cash, a little planning goes a long way. I'm Dan Hoffman. Thanks for joining us on Farm Connections.